If you turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 1. So good to be back with you guys and be back over here on this side of the pond and see so many familiar faces and uh, how I'm blessed to always do what little I may can to come alongside the work that God has called all of you to and um, see just the wonderful things that are happening and the wonderful testimonies. Praise the Lord for that. Dr. Mark Dever, what a blessing, brother. My church has bought hundreds of your books and given them away. So uh, maybe we have paid your trip over, I don't know. But uh, uh, they, they've been super profitable in so many, many ways. And I don't know if Mark's a cheater or not, but he got on the topic I was supposed to preach on and just tore it to pieces. <laughs> no, not really. Did a great job, but uh, thank you for that good word. I, the, the, the boss told me, you know, in the Bible there's the law of the Medes and the Persians, and here there's the law of Barry King. And um, he said, I want you to take an exposition. Do an exposition on the topic you're preaching on. And I said, well, Barry, the, if there's ever a time, Mark, I quit, you, I quit preaching topical sermons a long time ago. I do biblical systematic overviews of a subject, you know. That's a better way to say it, I found out <laughs> in uh, certain settings. But I said, if there's ever a time I'd like to do a systematic overview, it's when somebody asks me to preach on the church. I mean, I'd love to do that, but I'm going to do what he's told me to do. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. I, I don't know for sure, but this has got to be one of the sections of Scripture that gives the overview of sound biblical theology, or what is the overall theology, which Mark has so wonderfully pointed out to us already. All right? Ephesians chapter 1, let's begin in verse 4 and let's go through verse 14. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, in the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth, in Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Of course, there's no way we can unpack everything that's here, but let's give an attempt to do a, a, a good unpacking of what Paul is saying here and hopefully we'll leave a little more enamored with, a little more in love with, a little more treasuring this Christ whom we serve and a little more thoroughly committed to be centered and biblically balanced in our theology as we preach through books of the Bible. Now Ephesians 3.21 is a verse that grabbed me many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, hopefully all Scripture grabs us. But it just sort of grabbed me as, as, as a centerpiece of what we're all about. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Think about that. To Him be glory in the church. And on an equal plane, at least for that verse. And in Christ Jesus. Forever and ever. Amen. The church is the centerpiece of God's purposes and God's glory for time and eternity. Let me say that again. The church is the centerpiece of God's purposes and God's glory both for time and for eternity. And Mark, I, I often say to my church, and if I'm teaching pastors, all theology is local church theology. And I, I have a, a conviction that only as you begin to see God bring a church to some element of spiritual health, what I would call becoming a true church, do you begin to grasp really all the theology the Bible's trying to teach you. Because God's not really interested in just improving your intellect. God's interested in building His church. All theology is local church theology. 
Now, first of all, Roman number one, as we try to unpack this, notice the sovereign purpose and plan of the Father. The sovereign purpose and plan of the Father. The first sub point would be, He picked His own. Not very deep, is it? You know, I found that some of the doctrines of Scripture are not really hard. They just are so contrary to our flesh. He picked His own. Verse 4, He speaks of us being chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Chosen is the idea to be picked out. And He says we were picked out to be His before the foundation of the world. If I was at home in my church and didn't care about the time, I'd go to 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, Colossians 3, 12, 2 Timothy 2, 10, many other texts. But I think you're on board with me here. Same idea as the word election. Luke 18, 7, Now shall not God bring about justice for His elect? Romans 8, 33, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? That, verse is, that word rather is used often also. So Christians are true believers are God's elect, not by chance or by human design, but by God's sovereign, unconditional choice. Therefore, in Philippians 3.20, the Bible says we already have a citizenship in heaven. So, He picked us. That's His sovereign purpose and plan. But secondly, He picked us, or predestined us rather, to be His own sons. He predestined us to be His own sons. Notice how He says it there in verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus to Himself. Then He adds the phrase, according to the kind intention of His will. That just means He chose to do it. He wanted to do it. It was His will to do it. Why did God do it this way? Doesn't matter. He's God. He willed to do it that way. Don't you, aren't you glad that we serve a God that you just bow before? You yield to Him and say, yes, Lord. Even on those difficult points where we can't with our little narrow gray matter between our ears grasp all that He's about and all that He's doing. But He predestined us to be sons. Now to predestine is the simple idea to decide beforehand. To mark out beforehand. He, he marked us out beforehand. And in concert with the, the previous verse, that would be before the foundation of the world, that we would be His sons. This is a very precious and wonderful part of our being chosen or being elected. You see, He did not choose me to be a captive. That's one captured and ruled by His iron fist. He did not predestine or choose me to be a bond slave. It means I would have to work for Him apart from His love and His acceptance. He did not choose me or predestine me to be a servant. That means I would obtain favor from Him on a conditional basis. Now we do view ourselves that way, and it is true that we walk in that kind of spirit, but that's not what He's saying here. He's saying you're not just on my side. You're not just on my team. I've chosen and ordained before the foundation of the world that you would be my son. Son. Not just any son, but a son that he's predetermined to form in the image of his own son and precious one and only son, Jesus Christ. What a powerful truth that is and how encouraging. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 15, we cry, Abba, Father, Papa. There's an intimacy, a familial spirit in that term. What a security. You know, some time ago in at least Baptist life in America, and I'm sure it's everywhere in evangelical life, there was a whole lot of secular psychology creeping into the church, and there's all this thing about self-worth and self-image, and uh, which, which I reject the psychological conclusions about that. But when you grasp that before the foundation of the world, the Almighty and Sovereign God marked me out to be a precious son, that is security. That is security. Well, don't have time, but in addition to that, He predestined us or chose us to be, verse 4, holy and blameless before Him in love. That's glorious. But for time's sake, let's, let's move on a little bit further. Not only did He pick us, not only did He predestine us to be sons, but thirdly, He favored and blessed those He picked and predestined with God-sized blessings. God-sized blessings. Verse 7, the last phrase, according to the riches of His grace. Well, the first part is in Him we have redemption through His blood, 
the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. I think it's accurate here to, to remind ourselves, He didn't say out of His riches, but according to. In other words, God didn't go to the vast storehouse of grace and scoop up a handful or a scoopful like you might measure out a scoop of grain out of a bin. God did not go to the safe of His grace and select some gems or jewels of grace out of the collection and give to us. God didn't reach into the reservoir of grace and dip out a gallon bucket of grace and pour it on us like you might draw out of an old-fashioned well. No, when God brought His grace on us, it's like what we have in North Alabama on the Tennessee River. Now our rivers are quite a bit bigger than your rivers. The Tennessee River would be about like the Thames River, I suppose. And Wilson Dam is right there where I live in the Shoals area. And Wilson Dam is the deepest fresh water lock in eastern United States. And when they let the water out of that lock at Wilson Dam, I'm going to tell you below the dam, there's this mighty, powerful, bubbling, boiling gush of water that goes on and on until the whole lock is depleted again of water. That's what it means. When God lavished His grace upon us. He didn't just kind of part way do something nice. This redemptive grace is so infinitely greater than common grace. So He did it in a God-sized way. He poured that grace on us. When God put His own Son on the cross to become sin and bear the weight of sin for us in our place, that's the full measure of of grace. Now yes, when the sun rises, that's God's grace. And it's grace when the rain falls and waters our plants and our crops. It's grace when we enjoy the fellowship of a friend. It's grace when we are fed or clothed or have decent transportation. But the full measure of grace comes when God shed the blood of His own Son in our place on the cross. The priceless blood of Christ is the measure of the wealth of God's unmerited favor toward all who believe. 1 Peter 1.18 Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Lloyd-Jones says the riches of His grace are as large and as great and as profound as God Himself. For God gave Himself in His Son. So many millions of saints over the centuries, all of those past saints drank from this fountain, and it's as full today as it was at the beginning. Millions perhaps, millions perhaps will yet drink from it, but it'll still be bubbling up to overflowing. He poured this out. It's according to the riches of His grace. And then as I've referred to already getting ahead of myself, He lavished it on us. It's just, if Paul continues in verse 8 and said, I've got to say some more here. I've got to lay on some more uh, superlatives, if you will. We've got to even say more. He lavishes it on us. God didn't just forgive, but His forgiveness is lavished upon us. Would you grasp that, sinner? Would you grasp that? But you don't know how I struggle and how I fail. Yes, but where sin abounds, their grace does that much more abound. That's what Paul's saying here. Wow, that's good news for sinners like me. Sinners like you. So God pours His favor and blessing on us in a God-sized package. Now, hinting at what I want to say a lot about in the end, the first part of verse 6, why does he do this? Well, first of all, he just, the kind intention of his will, last part of verse 5, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. To show forth the great glory of what God can do that men cannot do. And then in verse 13, he says, we have to believe. There is that side of the coin. The old argument, how do, you, how do you balance man's responsibility and God's sovereignty? And I've never heard a better answer than Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I never try to reconcile old friends. Man is responsible, but God is sovereign. I'm remodeling a, 
a cabin on, a, on some farm, farmland and, and I've noticed as I'm remodeling the cabin I can only look at one side at a time and when I have the contractors out there I'll say let me show you how this looks and I'll say well I have to walk to the other side to show you the back side of it and we have to keep walking around but God's not like that. He can see both sides at once. He doesn't have to look at one side at a time. Well, the Father's purpose and plan. Secondly, let's notice here the son's procuring. The son, the procuring of the son of this plan the father laid out. He's going to be the agent that procures it to the end that God will get the glory he deserves and the children will be saved. Now, one of the great attributes of God is his faithfulness. So when God says, I picked you, I predestined you, we know that in that he's also provided a satisfactory provision, a procurement of what he has picked and predestined to happen. So he's come along and through his son provided the means whereby righteously his plan would come to fruition. Now he uses the word redemption in verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption is the idea of lawfully or rightfully being released from the state of slavery. Now you and I both know that uh, slavery was very, very prominent prominent rather in ancient Rome. One scholar said there were like seven million slaves in Rome at the time of this writing. And they understood well what this meant. But there was also a provision whereby a family member or someone who cared enough could purchase your price, could buy you and purchase you out of slavery and set you free. And they would give you a written documentation that you had been redeemed, that you had been set free from that slavery. And that's the picture Paul gives us here. Redemption from the, the bondage of slavery. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, we have a true spiritual redemption. Christ buying us for Himself and setting us free from the slavery of sin, of self, of Satan, and ultimately, of course, condemnation. Now that, of course, includes the remission of our sins. We have to remind ourselves that the remission of our sins came at a very high price, the blood of of Christ. The blood of Christ was the ransom money, if you will, demanded to loosen, to, to loosen us from that slavery and loose sins old on our lives. We used to sing an old song in seminary. I don't know that we've sung it much since, but it's called He Ransomed Me. Hallelujah, what a Savior who could take a poor lost sinner, lift him from the mighty clay and set him free. I'll ever see it, tell the story shouting glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Jesus ransomed me. Now there's an idea not only of, of redemption here and ransom here, there's also a picture of new revelation here. New revelation that's been provided as Jesus is procuring the Father's purpose. Look at it there, if you will, in, in verse 8. It says, He lavished on us, then it says, in all wisdom and insight. I think two things are happening here. I think first of all, we, we are understanding that it was God's wisdom and God's insight that man could be saved through this glorious provision God would make through His Son, Jesus Christ. That is the greatest wisdom of the ages that God would bring salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so God's wisdom unfolds in that gospel message. But also He says in verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of His will in the same context. So when you are born again, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, there begins to be this sanctification process where you begin to understand the wisdom of God. Now you will never understand it exhaustively, though one day in heaven you'll have a perfect mind, you will not have an infinite mind, and I'm convinced that for all eternity we'll perfectly take in the wisdom, the glories, and the beauties of God and never exhaust it. As a figure of speech, every day in heaven, we will get up and learn more of the glories of God in His wisdom, His, His beauty, and His perfections, and it will fill us with deep, deep pleasure, and we'll think, wow, I get to get up tomorrow and just start again. You'll never exhaust the wonders of God in Jesus Christ. But we begin to see it, maybe through a mirror dimly, shadowy down here. We don't get it all, but, we get, but what we do get is good, and it is true. While the world parades around that they have the answers and they have the insight and they have the wisdom. Oh my goodness, look at our culture. Our culture basically says this, look inside you and find truth. And then they begin to express and live out what's on the inside. And it doesn't look like any good truth to me. It looks like rotten filth. 
The stuff man's coming up with as he looks inside to find, inside rather to find the truth of quote who he is. Oh, the bizarre stuff. But look, truth is objective. It has to be discovered. Truth is not subjective. And we begin to find the objective truth of God, and particularly His plan to save men through Jesus Christ when we come to be born again and illumined by the Holy Spirit of God. We're no longer like some French philosopher, one of the, I can't pronounce his name, so I'll not try, but here's his quote. The universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? I haven't the slightest idea, and I'm convinced that no one has the least idea. Thank God we're not there. Amen? So we have a, a, a redemption in Christ Jesus. There's new revelation. We begin to grasp and, and see and understand about God and His purpose and His plan through Christ Jesus. But also there's a better restoration. There's a new restoration He talks about here in verses 10 through 12. He said God's got this plan. He picked out some. He predestined them to be sons. This is all happening through the redemption of His Son, procured that is through Jesus Christ, and it's all flowing to verse 10 with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things on the earth. In Him we also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of His glory. So he talks about this restoration. There is a comprehensiveness, if you will, and a universality to God's redemption through Jesus Christ. He's redeeming more than just human souls. Much, much more. When the idea talks of, the Bible rather talks here about a new administration, it doesn't mean a new dispensation. An administration, I'm convinced, is radically different from anything man has ever known. At least God's administration is. And the cornerstone of this administration was laid when the Word became flesh. That was the pivotal point of human history. It marked the beginning of the end times of the last days. It was the final scene of world history that began when the Word became flesh. And he talks about this new administration is in the, is in the, is in the fullness of times. It means upon the fullness of the times. In other words, when the season of time completes its course having been fixed by God before the foundation of the world, then the new administration will be established. I'm convinced this is the same thing as the kingdom of God being established in the earth. And then he says, the summing up of all things in Christ. All things summed up in Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 says, all things are created through Him. Now listen, and for Him. <coughs> through Him and for Him. So, paradise that was lost in Adam is going to be restored in Jesus Christ. But now, listen. The entire universe is going to unite again in harmony under His headship. And everything that is alien and discordant on the world, in the world or in the universe will be abolished. All that's going to happen at this appointed time when He comes with eyes like a flame of fire with a rod of iron in His hand and a sharp sword in His mouth. And He will at that time destroy all who oppose Him. And He will establish His kingdom, a kingdom of peace and one in which righteousness dwells. It's going to be united under Christ. Now listen, not a return back. Not a return back to the exact kind of kingdom that was here before Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. It's going to be a much better and much greater administration than that first administration. Because all the universe will have now seen more of God. They will have seen the demonstration of His righteousness in justice, and of course in wrath, but also the administration of His, His grace and His mercy and His love in building His church. So the new administration that's established on the earth will feature the product of Christ's procuring work, the bride of Christ, the trophy of God's amazing grace. And so there we have Ephesians 3.21, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. For all eternity the church will still, still be because it's the, the centerpiece of Christ's work, it'll be the centerpiece of Christ's glory. My point is, and I preach this to my people all the time, therefore, if this is true, we must give everything for the church. The church is worth giving your life because it's the centerpiece of God's work and God's glory for time and eternity. 
Now he begins to show the comprehensiveness here of all peoples involved in this great work God's doing through his son. Look at verse 11, if you will. Also, we have obtained an inheritance. We're, we're part of this predestination. I think he's talking about himself and his Jewish brethren there. The Jews. God has chosen out of the Jewish nation those whom he predestined according to his purpose after the counsel of his own will. So the Jews who were the first to believe, and then he comes down to verse 13, in him you also, verse 13, you also, including the Gentiles, God has chosen, he's picked out some among the Jews, and he's picked out some among the Gentiles. He's predestined some among the Jews, and he's predestined some among the Gentiles to be his own sons. <laughs> that he might send his son for them. And his son would go to the cross. And his son would perfectly in righteousness procure their redemption. And then all, when, when the fullness of times comes, he will bring all this to a completion in a perfected heaven and a perfected earth. <coughs> now the last part of verse 11, he says, according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. In other words, he is entirely responsible for the conception of all of this, for the in in initiation of all of this redemption, and for carrying it out and finally establishing a completed new administration in the earth. He says in verse 13, but then we listen, having listening, listened rather, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit a promise. Now, scholars argue, I'm not a scholar, but the phrase having also believed I'm convinced, should not be translated after that you believed. I think so what he's saying is this work of the Spirit we're going to look at includes the enablement of the Spirit through conviction and regeneration to bring you to faith. It's a part of the whole process God is doing through His Son and now through His Spirit. So let's quickly mention the third thing. Not only the Father's purpose and plan and the Son's procurement of the plan, but thirdly, the Spirit's application. The Spirit's application. Get verse 13, if you will. Last part. Having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. Being in the sphere of Christ, being a believer in Christ, you were sealed. Now, in the Bible, I find at least three things a seal speaks to. It speaks of ownership. It speaks of ownership. In Revelation 7, 2 the angel having the seal of the living God. It means that's God's holy angel. Ownership. It also speaks of approval. Approval. In John 6, 27, God set His seal on Jesus. God says, I fully approve of Him. And therefore, if you're in Him, He fully approves of you, by the way. So it speaks of approval. But thirdly, not only of ownership and of approval, but thirdly, it speaks of security. The Romans in Matthew 27, 66 set their seal on the tomb saying this is not to be moved by the authority of Rome. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are one that He picked, that He predestined to be sons, and that He procured your redemption through Jesus Christ. And then the Spirit came in time and space history and applied the merits of Christ to your life. And in that experience, you became a believer. And that God has therefore set a seal on you that says, this is my property. No one can touch it. I've told our folks many times, if you, if you want the perseverance of the saints, or as we say in America, once saved, always saved. Does that work in the British kingdom over here? Once saved, always saved. Eternal security of the believer. Our forefathers understood eternal security because they understood divine election. You don't really get the last one without the first ones. They all come together, if you will, as one package. So he talks about the seal of the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes and does a work in us, and as we experience the work, we sense and see and realize His seal is on us. His ownership, the approval, the, the, the authentication that I'm His is there because the Spirit has sealed me, and I have experienced that sealing work. Now he goes on to just build on our assurance with verse 14, 
who's given as a pledge, I like the word deposit, but given as a pledge of our inheritance with the view to the redemption of God's own possession. What powerful assurance. Over and over, Paul is just heaping one powerful truth on another. You're God's own possession, and therefore God has made sure that the down payment, the deposit, has been made for you because more is coming. The completion of the transaction is coming. You're not like Jesus yet. You're not glorified yet. You're not sanctified completely, at least not in, in, in practicality yet. But the deposit's been made because the Spirit is in you. How do I know, Pastor, that the Spirit is in me? You grieve over your sins. You're beginning to understand the weightiness of your offensiveness to a holy God. You're beginning to sense the complete unworthiness and radical depravity before a holy God. You didn't grasp it all. I haven't grasped it all. But only the Spirit makes that clear to men. And then equal to that, you're grasping in great joy the wealth of the procurement work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn and blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Why? Because the Spirit makes us aware of our great, great need. But at the same time, the Spirit says, but Christ paid for it all. You're secure in Him. He wrought your redemption. And God put it that way from before the foundation of the world. The down payment's been made. And God never made a down payment that He can come and pay the balance off. That's why you know you're going to get all the way from <laughs> regeneration to sanctification to glorification. It's going to happen. You know, when we have the deposit of the Spirit, and this is what we're missing in a lot of Reformed circles, that we're spiritually dead. Sometimes guys are dotting every I and crossing every T, but where's the power of the Spirit? We are changed lives. Now listen... That last. That last. I'm just learning this, to be honest. And God took me through a lot of things to get me to the end of my techniques and my theology to see that that must be there. But theology without life is nothing. Paul said, you are my book known and read of all men. You are changed life. And guys, as we get in our pulpits, we must preach with a desperate dependence and radical confidence that God's Spirit will use God's Gospel and change men and build His church. And He sets His seal on them. So when one is born again, he needs to begin to understand, I've got the seal of God on my life. Well, my topic is biblical theology. So let me just mention... I said the third thing. Let me give you a fourth thing real quick. The culmination of the scheme. The culmination of the whole scheme. Verse 14. <laughs> Six words. To the praise of His glory. To the praise of His glory. You know God's obsessed with being God. He's absolutely obsessed with being God. Because if He was obsessed or happy or thrilled over anything else, He'd be less than God. Because He can only be obsessed and thrilled and happy over what's absolutely perfect and righteous. And... He's it. <laughs> He's the only one. And He wants more of what He is to be seen, made much of. As I've told you before, and I tell my folks a lot, God needed radical, wicked, vile, depraved, worthless sinners to show mercy and grace to so He could illustrate how great His mercy and grace was. And all of you qualify. We're all those kind of sinners. And so God says, I'm going to be saving out of the Jews and out of the Gentiles putting into local New Testament churches all these peoples to the end that as time winds down and the full administration of all that I'm purposing to accomplish comes to an end, I will be praised and glorified and honored forever. So in our theology, let's keep central that God has a plan to save for Himself a people through the merits of His Son and He's going to apply the Spirit to certain individuals' lives and bring the application of Christ's work to their lives. And He's going to assemble this bride, if you will, perfectly so that for all eternity, that bride might know Him, love Him, and enjoy Him and give Him glory. From Genesis 1 through the last of Revelation, that's what God's doing. And that's, I believe, a sound outline what our theology will be and a sound outline of what Paul's telling the church at Ephesus. Because what does he say three times? Look at it real quick. Verse 6. He did all these glorious things, choosing and predestining, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. And then we come down to verse 12. 
to the end that. In other words, summarizing why he's doing these things so that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. So Jews are going to be saved by grace, through faith, by the, by the merits of Christ, to the end that God would be praised and glorified. And then Gentiles 2, verse 14, who's given as a pledge of our inheritance with the beauty and redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. It's like he can't say it enough. And you jump over to 321, to him be glory in the church. Why? Because the church is what God's doing. The Father's purpose and plan, the Son's procurement of the purpose and plan, the Spirit's application to the lives, the sealing of the Spirit, and then the culmination of the scheme. God gets glory for it forever and ever and ever. If there's one thing I could, if I could just implant it in the hearts and minds of pastors, it would be this. An undying passion for God's glory. When you've done your 50th case of church discipline and they're still getting mad and still eating. When you refuse to baptize a kid because he can recite a prayer at vacation Bible school. And the grandparents get mad and leave your church. There's only one thing that's going to hold you. At least it has me for 35 years. The glory of God. I'm not going to do what dishonors my Lord. It's the only thing that will keep you the long term, the glory of God. Because that's what Paul is saying is the main thing. And that's what is the main thing. Can we pray together? Mm-hmm. Our Father, these are sweet, dear folks. They never fail to help me and encourage me. And Lord, I'm tired and I'm jet lagged and I was tired when I got on the plane so I don't know that I've been that effective in my verbalization but I pray the Spirit of God will just stir their hearts afresh that this great God and this great plan and this great Christ and this great Holy Spirit that applies the work of Christ is worth everything. May we get in on, Lord, you building your church for your glory. We commit ourselves afresh to the task. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.